And we know that education is the way. We know that if our children are better educated and our families are better educated, then we're going to see better results and outcomes for them. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Grasswich. Welcome to Schools on Point. Today we will be talking about major issues impacting public education here in Southern California and across the state. With me is Dr. Deborah Duardo, the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools. The Los Angeles County Office of Education is the nation's largest regional public education agency. We serve 80 public school districts and 13 community colleges that educate 2.5 million students. Joining us is Assemblymember Sydney Kamlager Dove. Assemblymember Kamlager Dove is a Democrat representing the 54th Assembly District, which encompasses communities west of downtown Los Angeles. The assembly member is a member of the Arts, Entertainment, Sports, Tourism, and Internet Media Committee, as well as the Committee on Public Safety and the Powerful Rules Committee. She is also a member of the Select Committee on Uplifting Girls and Women of Color and the chair of the Assembly Select Committee on Incarcerated Women. Prior to being elected to the State Assembly in April 2018, Ms. Kamlogger Dove was president of the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees and District Director to California State Senator Holly Mitchell. Welcome, and with that, let's begin. Assemblymember, you've had a long history in government and politics. Can you tell us a little bit about that history and how that's shaped your current uh, role in government? Yes, yeah, so first I wanna say it's a pleasure to be here and to spend time with both of you all talking about important issues. <clears throat> so I'm a girl from Chicago. I was actually um, raised there and attended public and uh, Jesuit schools while I was there and got my first taste of politics helping my grandmother get Harold Washington elected as the first black mayor in Chicago. I also, um, you know, remember uh, walking picket lines with my mother and really being involved in activist um, sort of activities while I was growing up and it really taught me that it's important to be engaged it's mm -hmm. important to find your voice to know your voice and to step into the issues and I think it's it's those kinds of experiences uh, that encouraged me to seek public office and you know we there's something that we share a lot in common with LACO and that is the uh, importance of implicit bias and understanding that the role implicit bias mm -hmm. plays um, can you tell us about you know, the significant legislation that you've introduced uh, in relation to implicit bias? Yes, yes, and I'm uh, grateful that the governor signed uh, my implicit bill um, package. Uh, you know, implicit bias is something we don't really talk a lot about um, because folks want to assume that it's synonymous with racism or sexism, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's very uncomfortable for people. But the reality is, is that we all have implicit bias. We all, um, you know, have unconscious bias that creeps up in some of the most, you know, strange and not so strange moments. Um, and it's how we acknowledge that bias uh, to help us manage it. That was what my bill package was about. So I um, introduced three bills, 241, 242, and 243. 241 deals with mandating implicit bias training in the medical community for surgeons, nurses, and physicians' assistants. And 242 requires implicit bias training for um, those that deal with uh, the judicial court system, so judges, attorneys, clerks, and bailiffs. And the notion is that um, if you are in a life or death situation, you're going to visit your doctor or you're before a judge in a courtroom, wouldn't we want all of the folks who are treating us or taking care of us or making some decisions about our future to be operating with as little implicit or unconscious bias as possible? Because we don't want those biases to creep into their perception of us and then how to handle us. And 243 was a bill that dealt with mandating implicit bias for law enforcement, which would also include law enforcement in school districts. Well, I think that's wonderful, and we're really excited. And a lot of our work in LA County is about making sure 
that the training is taking place across all of our 80 districts and bringing in our teachers and our administrators and ensuring that they understand what impl implicit bias is, that they're just aware. And it's just like you said, it's people never want to talk about right. this. It's like, I don't want to be, you know, accused of being a racist or a sexist and, and just really getting people to feel comfortable mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. having a conversation and learning that everybody has biases. Mm -hmm. It's a fact of life and it's just being aware of it and making sure that when we're interacting with our children that we're not allowing any type of bias impede our ability right. to eng engage and, and ensure that they're doing well in school. Right. If you are acknowledging that you have it, then you're more likely to engage in learning the tools that you need to manage it and to hopefully diminish it over the course of time. We also know that there's no kind of training that's a silver bullet that will eliminate the bias altogether, but it's how we manage it, how we manage it when we're teaching, when we're correcting, when we're educating, when we're providing development opportunities. Um, when we're disciplining and when we're prescribing, mm -hmm. you know, bias should not be prevalent in those decisions. Well, I was just thinking about SB 188 that, that you know, you were very much a leader in, in ensuring that implicit bias um, doesn't come into the mm -hmm. place when we're, we're making mm -hmm. policies that impact our children mm -hmm. and 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 this is a perfect example with SB 188 about making sure that children or anyone is not discriminated against right. because of their hair yes which was one of the yes. things that for me was just unbelievable like how do we right. tell someone your hair is unruly you shouldn't be allowed to come to yes. school or you're not appropriate uh, and don't fit into this work setting mm -hmm. because you have a different mm -hmm. type of hair. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, that was really amazing when, you know, when I first thought about, like, how could anybody right. Why do we look at this? someone right. and say, your hair has an impact on your ability mm -hmm to do your job mm -hmm. or to learn. So mm -hmm. tell us more about that. Yeah, so a very exciting bill, the first of its kind across the country, and then other states have been replicating this in their own assembly houses. SB 188 says that you cannot um, uh, terminate or um, promote or deny employment to someone because of their hair. And it also says uh, that schools cannot disrupt a child's education, you know, based on their hair. And it's to your point, uh, you know, how do we define conformity? You know, mm -hmm. what is the standard by which we as employees and students are being held? Um, my hair should not prevent me from being able to learn. Um, it does not impede my ability to read and write and take mm -hmm. a test. And it also shouldn't impede your ability to teach me, right? right. To hire me, to work with me, um, to collaborate with me. And so it is strange that in 2019 we need this bill, but it's a reality. I mean, so many women, mostly women of color, um, who choose to wear their hair in a natural form have faced mm -hmm. discrimination, have been asked to conform. Um, this is my natural hair, but I certainly have blown it dry. Mm -hmm. I have pressed it. I have curled it to look, you know, to make it look more like Shirley Temple curls. I have done all of those things that will really allow me to fade into the background mm -hmm. so that my hair does not become the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been so many times when people have said, can I touch your hair? How do you clean your hair? Oh, how do you wear it like that? And you don't really want to have those conversations, especially mm -hmm. when you're a young person mm -hmm. already dealing with hormones and, and growing up and the social challenges that come with going to school. So we don't want kids to feel that way and we don't want adults to feel that yeah. way. And we just recently hosted an event here. It was the Dove Self-Esteem Project and it was yes. with Senator Holly Mitchell and Chandra Ryan and we invited a hundred middle school girls of color to engage in conversations about this mm. issue, about mm -hmm. how they should feel confident mm -hmm. and beautiful with their natural hair. But what was sad to me was even at that event, I talked to so many girls and we heard girls sharing their mm. stories and their experiences about being discriminated against, about being suspended from mm. school, yes. about having been bullied because of their hair. And so, 
you know, for us, it was so wonderful to finally have something official saying, this is not acceptable, yeah. we're not going to tolerate it, and, and empowering girls to get them to, to feel confident and beautiful in their mm -hmm. natural, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with their natural hair, with their bodies, you know, with all of mm -hmm. it, because there's so much, especially with young girls, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, impacts their ability to feel good about so themselves. So how did they say they dealt with that? You know, it was different. Some of the girls never told anybody and they just held it within. Uh, some girls were really empowered. They had the support of their parents who filed lawsuits mm, and, really? and, and the community, you know, stood behind them. So, I mean, I think it's different for different mm -hmm, girls, but mm -hmm. it's, just, it's, just sad. it's so sad to me that that should ever be an issue, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think the incident that happened earlier this year uh, tells the story completely, right? Mm -hmm. A young man uh, in a wrestling match who mm -hmm. was forced to cut off his dreads mm -hmm. to make the decision to cut your hair off right then and there or mm -hmm. to and let your teammates down, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you don't. Mm -hmm. And so no child mm -hmm. should have to be forced to make that kind of decision. You know, our, our beauty, our professionalism, our scholarliness, it has nothing to do with if our hair is straight, curly, black, brown, gray, mm -hmm. white, dreaded, locked, you know, none of that plays a role in how beautiful we are, how professional we are, or how scholarly we are. Exactly. Your commitment to this topic <laughs> certainly speaks to also your role on the Committee of Uplifting Girls of Color. Can you speak a little bit about that work and, and your role there? Yes, I was asked to uh, join the committee by the chair, Assemblymember Carrillo, and very excited to lend my voice and my perspective to the conversation on how we uplift women and girls of color. There have been similar committees on men and boys of color, and they certainly deserve that space. But it's really also important to recognize that, that young girls, that young women, face issues of discrimination and marginalization. And so how do we create an ample space for them to share their stories so that we can learn from them and then hopefully allow those stories to feed in to legislation and good policy. So the first hearing will be happening in March and I'm very excited and hopeful about what will come from it. Well, that's exciting again to us because um, you know, we really uh, come from an approach of we need to do everything possible to build mm -hmm. self-esteem, to build uh, the spirit of our children, not to squelch their spirits. Uh, even how we refer to language, you know, recently there was a press conference held about AB 413, which is about changing the language that we use right. in ed code and penal code to define <laughs> children. And, right. You know, for us, we're talking about we should never, ever use deficit language mm -hmm. to define, right. to identify, to work with our children. And really understanding that every child, I don't care what background, you know, when they're going through certain times in life or through adolescence, uh, are going to have challenges, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And we should never let the challenges that they have define them. So we were really excited about, you know, eliminating the term at risk to identify youth and using at right, promise or right. other uplifting language. So I'm sure that's a part of, you know, what you're thinking about is like, how do we make mm -hmm. sure that we're empowering young girls, that we're uplifting mm -hmm. them and that our language, our action, um, our policies are all mm -hmm. aligned, mm -hmm. you know, to reach that goal. Yes, and also how our bias can in, prohibit us from really hearing them. A mm -hmm. study came out a few years ago that talked about young girls of color um, are, are given less access to resources because they're, they're sort of over-sexualized. Mm -hmm. A 13-year-old black or brown girl is sort of seen as being more sexually active than mm -hmm. other girls, and so mm -hmm. they're treated differently. Um, they're also sort of um, given less time in terms of sort of figuring out if they have any challenges because the assumption is that they're also more adult. And mm -hmm. so they need less development. They need less, um, I don't want to say coddling, but support. Mm -hmm. and, and so those also create deficits. Because if I approach you and you're a 13-year-old young girl of color and I, I, I think you're overly sexually active and I think that you're strong and you're adult, so I'm not going to come and chat with you and make sure you're okay. I'm going to go to these mm -hmm. other children. 
you're creating avenues of deficiency that also sort of inform their lack of trust mm -hmm. in systems. And ultimately, we're talking about systems. We're talking about an education system and how mm -hmm. that is um, really sort of solidified in equity mm -hmm. for all kids so that they can learn. Absolutely. As we're talking about systems, there's another uh, committee that you're highly involved in, and that is the Committee on Incarcerated Women, um, mm -hmm. another important topic for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Yes. Um, can you speak a little bit about your work there? So I love this tag team, because it's like <laughs> I'm talking about things that are happening in the policy world, and you're talking about what's happening um, in the real world down mm -hmm. here about the same issues. So I asked to chair this committee, and uh, once again, how we deal with men are, who are incarcerated is very different from how we deal with women. Um, you know, they're oftentimes they are 95% of the women who are incarcerated uh, are, are in there be, and they are suffering some form of domestic violence. Uh, many times they're given harsher sentences than men. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they're sort of, you know, dual charges, right? There's a domestic violence charge and then something else. Mm -hmm. um, nationally, we're sort of looking at federal prisons. Reasons, but we're not really talking about juvenile camps, we're not talking about state, we're not talking about local, um, we're not talking about entities like LACO when we're mm -hmm. talking about folks who are incarcerated. There's been a 200% increase in women who are incarcerated over the last 15 years. Um, and then we don't really talk about specific issues that women need while they're incarcerated and when they get out. So mm -hmm. I'm dealing with issues like, you know, not having enough sanitary napkins, mm -hmm. you know, not having underwear that fits for all kind of sized women. Mm -hmm. They also have fewer uh, diversionary programs that are made available to them. And so how, and then when they come out, parent and child reunification, mm -hmm. making sure that they have access to employment and financial aid so that they're not in the same situation that got them there. Oftentimes they're there because of some hookup with a partner. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to sort of separate these issues based on gender to allow us to enter into conversations around rehabilitation with a more empathic ear and then hope that that will also then translate to the men. I mean, I think that's wonderful. And, you know, I'll just add, because we provide the instruction for the girls who are incarcerated, that we need to see more early identification, mm -hmm. prevention, uh, resources that we're providing to children and families that are, are demonstrating um, issues, families that are already mm -hmm. in the system. I mean, we see right. so many young girls um, that, that need help, that were victims mm -hmm. and not provided the support. I mean, just up until not too long ago, girls were incarcerated for prostitution. Mm -hmm. How do you right. incarcerate a 13-year-old right. for prostitution instead of looking at it as right. sex trafficking? And thank God that has changed. But, you know, there's just so much more that we need to do to empower girls and to mm -hmm. help them with activities and, and resources that are going to help them heal mm -hmm. from some of the trauma that they've experienced mm -hmm. rather than to take a real puni a punitive right. approach. And not shaming them because of their sex, right? right? right. So a, a young girl who is pregnant at an early age, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many sort of things that are attached to that and how we perceive her, how mm -hmm. we feel that she should be educated, she should be picking one thing, right? Be mm -hmm. a parent or don't have the child or mm -hmm. stay in school. and so. There are all of these tropes that I think we have to reassess mm -hmm. as we're looking at, you know, how do we support these young girls? How do we continue to educate them? And then how do we help them heal? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we are so lucky to have <laughs> you uh, representing women and children and advocating for their needs because um, the, the, the demand is high and, and I'm sure it's very difficult and challenging, but we so much appreciate the fact that Thank you're there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the fact that you're here and running LACO and are bringing the lens that you have and the kind of compassion that you have to a lot of the programs that we're now seeing sort of take off um, or mm -hmm. expand and because we cannot look at how we fix problems in silos. Absolutely. As Dr. Dorado said, we are so appreciative of the work that you've done to support our young people, and so we're looking forward to the future, and can you share uh, some of the things that are on the horizon for you? Yes. Uh, well, I've been working with my LEDGE staff um, since interim has happened, and so we are trying to sort of pick through all of the options that are available to us to come up with a manageable but exciting bill package. I can tell you that we're looking to delve into housing, 
Um, mm -hmm. We're looking to delve into education. I will continue to be focused on criminal justice and, and very interested in environmental justice. I mean, with climate change and young folks who are, you know, leaving school on Friday to really protest what's happening to our, our mm -hmm. um, to Mother Earth, I think it's important that we in the legislature kind of take that up as well. So I am hopeful that good packages will be on the horizon and that the governor will sign all the new bills. Well, we're hopeful and excited and um, all areas of such high need. Uh, I mean, especially when you talk about, you know, housing with the homeless crisis right. that we're here in here in Los Angeles. I mean, we, we really need to think about changing policies. So. I think so. And, you know, in so many entities, I don't know if LACO has it, but I talked to folks at LAUSD and, you know, so many groups. The Community College District has property inventory. Mm -hmm. And so how do we begin to look sort of creatively at some of the underutilized property to figure out how we can be part of solutions as it relates to housing? Mm -hmm. well, it's going to we'll take see. all of us working uh, yeah. together and, um, you know, partnering to make a change. Right. Well, thank you. So there's so much more that we could talk about, but we've come to the end of our program. This show is brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Education, a public education agency dedicated to serving students, supporting communities, and leading educators. If you'd like to know more about the Los Angeles County Office of Education, you can visit us online at www.lacoe.edu. For questions, comments, or suggestions, you can email us at the address on screen. On behalf of the Los Angeles County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Deborah Eduardo, and our special guest, California State Assembly Member Sydney Kamlager Dove, I am Elizabeth Graswich, and until our next school's on point, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.